All right. Uh, hi, all. Thank you all for coming. Um, so today we are pleased to have Luis Rademacher here to give a talk. Uh, Luis is a professor at UC Davis in the math department uh, and works on a, a number of areas in theoretical CS, data science, matrix computations, um, a lot of very interesting stuff. So today I'll be talking about um, nice room approximation for kernel machines. Uh, Luis, take it away. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, theoretical machine learning, I would say. Um, uh, so the starting point of this project um, is, uh, is both theoretical and practical. It's about trying to make kernel machines more practical. Um, and uh, when I came to work with uh, my collaborators, they had already some practical work and uh, I, we were interested in getting stronger theoretical results. So that's why I'd say this part is more theoretical, but I'll give a kind of overview of the whole project if you like, but very briefly because there is um, uh, it's a series of papers in some sense, even though I am only part of one of them. So um, uh, this is joint work with Amir Sama Bet Sultan, Mihal Belkin, and Parte Pandit. Um, so let me start by clarifying what is the kernel machine model that um, I'm going to be focusing on. Um, I guess the versions in the papers could be slightly more general, but of course, uh, this is for the purpose of the presentation here. Um, uh, so I'm thinking that I have a labeled data set xi, yi, where xi's are points in Rd, and the yi's are real valued labels associated to these data points, and I have n data points. And um, we assume that the xi's are random according to some underlying distribution. And while well, ideally we want results that have weaker or no assumptions on the distribution, so we'll see how that works. Uh, our results are fairly weakly tied to the distribution, I would say, but you'll see. Um, and then uh, we have a symmetric positive definite kernel uh, that we call K. So this is a function of two elements in Rd into R. And informally, we can think of it as, as a measure of similarity between pairs of x values. So x and x prime and k of x, x prime is a notion of similarity. So larger values mean more similar. And a, a central object uh, in uh, for building theory behind this kind of model will be the concept of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space that will denote hk associated to the kernel. So there is some theory here so that if you have a kernel satisfying the right properties, which is more or less what's written in the previous line, um, then uh, there is an associated Hilbert space. The, the theory, um, uh, even though it starts very, with a very simple definition, is kind of complicated and I'll try to avoid the complications as much as possible. I'm not really an expert on RKHS, so I'm only telling you what you need to know. Um, and in this case, the main thing one needs to know first is that this is simply going to be uh, the space of functions that play the role of models. So functions that are going to be used when evaluated on an X point to predict the corresponding label Y, if possible. So it's just the space of models. And um, um, now the model of our, our choice of model for the purpose of this talk of what the predictive function is going to be, it will be the solution to the following, uh, in a sense, compound optimization problem. So there is first an inner optimization, which is simply to minimize the square loss. Um, this objective, uh, sorry, let me see if, um, can you see, let me switch to the pointer. Here, can you see the pointer? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, so this is the the standard uh, uh, least squares problem in some sense over the functions in the space given my data. Um, uh, but there is an an additional ingredient in that if the space of functions uh, that you allow is very large, then the solution to this uh, problem is not unique. 
And so among the many that there that you could have as uh, optimal functions, we pick the one that minimizes the um, uh, Hilbert space norm. So minimum HK norm solution to this quadratic optimization problem in the corresponding Hilbert space. Let me, um, uh, to make this a bit more concrete, switch immediately to an example. Um, so first I'll start by mentioning one of the most common choices of the kernel. Um, the most com uh, common choice would be the what is sometimes called the RBF, the regular basis function kernel or the Gaussian kernel, which is to simply make the similarity function, the Gaussian function with some uh, parameter sigma um, evaluated at the distance between a pair of points. So smaller distance means higher similarity and the function is higher. Um, and then, well, this is where the, the, the first uh, point where the theory of RKHS uh, starts to exhibit its sort of complexity, which is that once you are given the kernel, you may want to figure out, well, what is the corresponding uh, space of functions that you're allowing? And here I'm giving some description. There are many ways of uh, doing this, depending on, well, how much technology you want to use, uh, meaning there is an alternative way by using spectral decomposition of the kernel that gives, shows you many more things about the space, but here is a simple way of thinking without introducing too much technology, is um, to first um, fix one argument of the kernel while leaving the other argument free. So the dot is the free argument, I pick some value x. Uh, in this case, I'm thinking in one dimension, so d equals one. So you pick a value x in over the reals and you fix that argument and then you look at the corresponding function. If you think this kx dot, then it's going to be a translation of a Gaussian with fixed standard deviation, if you like. And then you consider the span of all such functions. So in other words, all linear combinations of translations of Gaussians. So here I have a picture that kind of um, uh, gives an idea of what happens uh, when you do that, right? Um, I have some data points or centers, so values x, one, two, three, four, five, about eight. And then um, I construct a Gaussian of fixed width on top of each of them. And then I take a combination with weights, possibly negative. So that's why some of them are below the axis. And well, when I take that weighted combination, I can construct this uh, fairly complicated function. Um, uh, so that explains what the space of functions is, except for one problem, the set of all these linear combinations is not uh, a Hilbert space because it's not complete. Um, so that's where it gets slightly more complicated. The true space is the completion of this space. And that will, in principle, add things or take some kind of limits, if you like. Um, the other missing ingredient is what is going to be the norm or inner product of this space. And uh, the norm is going to be given, or the inner product will be given by this, the kernel itself. So the inner product between two of these uh, elementary functions that we constructed, the translations of Gaussians, the inner product is going to be just the kernel evaluated at the two centers. And then, well, this is just defined on the um, uh, these kx dot functions. And then you extend it to the span by bilinearity, of course. Um, questions? OK, so. Um, well, I'll explain in a moment um, uh, how to actually try to sort of find the function that satisfies the model. And there is a long line of work that's so long that I cannot review in detail uh, about trying to make this faster or more efficient or whatever in, in different senses. Um, I will explain uh, in a little bit more detail, though, the last three works here, which are uh, different words trying to make this practical by my collaborators and, and also Xi Juan Ma, uh, former student of Michel Belkin. Um, uh, so this is a series of algorithms called EigenPro, EigenPro2, and EigenPro3. 
So let's get to how one may approach this problem algorithmically and also to try to make it more concrete because in the way I stated, right, I stated it as a problem, an optimization problem in an, an infinite dimensional space. So that doesn't sound very algorithmic when you say it like that, but that's where the theory of RKHS helps that makes the problem in practice uh, a lot more concrete and simpler and approachable from the algorithmic point of view. Um, so here I have repeated the model uh, so that uh, we don't need to go back to that slide in case you already forgot or, or you need to see it again. Um, so the, the key uh, theoretical ingredient here is what is called the representative theorem that says that out of this infinite dimensional space, potentially, where you have to find your solution, I say potentially because um, um, the, the, the Hilbert space could be finite dimensional depending on what kernel you choose. Uh, but uh, in the previous example with the translation for Gaussians is actually infinite dimension. So um, out of this infinite dimensional space, I only need to look at uh, functions of a particular form, which are linear combinations of these uh, one argument kernel functions at your data points. So this is a finite sum over uh, I equals one to N. Um, so that's, well, it gives me a representation of the optimal solution to the problem, both in terms of the inner minimization and the outer minimum HK norm aspect. And so when you see that, what you, the, or the sort of the obvious thing to try is to write this now as a linear system in the, where the parameters to the terminal are the alpha i's, and we're trying to express the function f in the basis k x i dot. So that leads this to this linear system q is an n by n linear system where n was the number of data points, where the entries of the matrix are the kernel evaluated at the data points, and then alpha, and then the right hand side, which are the labels that we were trying to predict from the data. Um, uh, the problem here, of course, is that if you truly try to solve this directly, um, that will restrict the values of n you can use because uh, any uh, direct method would take time about order n q. Um, so we would like to do better than that in some way. And um, uh, well, in terms of linear systems, we have iterative algorithms, but uh, because we're talking about uh, uh, Machine learning, um, actually, we know that something that would be very promising would be if we can make something like stochastic gradient descent work. Um, um, because uh, it would be running on this complex quadratic program. Uh, now, as a sort of a way of understanding how stochastic gradient descent may behave, of course, it's helpful to think in parallel about gradient descent simply. So, uh, for the purpose of building theory here uh, in, in the talk, I'm going to be talking about gradient descent, but in the papers, you can find discussions, of course, of how to make this even more practical by using stochastic gradient descent. And uh, yeah, um, there are some additional complications, of course, because you have more parameters to choose in that case. Um, so uh, again, and you have to clarify and to put gradient descent in context of how to turn the, the infinite dimensional problem into a finite dimensional problem when you're thinking of running gradient descent. Again, the original problem is in this infinite dimensional space. And uh, we would like to understand the behavior of gradient descent in that space. But this is really um, as an, an equivalent or, or, or I guess, uh, an algorithm that is more feasible for theoretical analysis to look at what's going on in the Hilbert space. But really the algorithm has a parallel formulation in the finite dimensional formulation in the basis of kxy dot, uh, xi dot, um, where I'm iterating over the parameter alpha instead. But because I'm changing the basis and things like that, uh, that's not a quite gradient descent, of course, but it corresponds to another well-known algorithm for linear systems called Richardson iteration. Um, I'm not gonna use this, but it's helpful to understand what's uh, going on, if you know what that is. It's a classic algorithm for linear systems. Okay, so now let's, um, try to understand how much time it's going to take to run gradient descent 
on this problem. Again, the implementation is doing this for in quotes dual thing, which, which is Richardson iteration, but everything we have a gradient descent applies to the actual implementation. Um, and here, well, again, uh, the, we can invoke standard analysis of gradient descent, except that we need it in this infinite dimensional space in principle. Uh, but uh, more or less nothing changes. The standard, again, because of the problem is effectively finite dimensional in the end. Um, uh, and the theory will say that the number of iterations for the original problem to achieve some error tau is uh, bounded by the condition number of, well, if this was a standard gradient descent on a quadratic program in a finite dimensional setting, this uh, would be the Hessian of the quadratic form. And as we'll see, it's still the Hessian, except that we need to do this correctly in our Hilbert space, but that's uh, more or less straightforward. So the number of iterations would be the condition number of the Hessian times log of one over tau. So what is the Hessian in this case? Um, uh, there are several ways of writing this depending on what you want to do. Um, but I mean, informally speaking, it's this finite dimensional operator on the Hilbert space that is a sum of n rank one operators that are constructed from the kernel. Actually, the precise form of the operator is not super important here in case uh, it looks complicated to you. The main thing that's important is that it's actually finite rank. Um, and therefore, the condition number corresponds to a condition number of a matrix-like thing or a, fi a finite rank operator, which is easy to define. Here, it would be lambda one of k divided by lambda n of k. So it's essentially the standard definition. Um, and um, because it's finite rank, the finite dimensional theory applies actually. I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but it's a simple exercise to do that. Like whenever you think of the finite dimensional version, well, you have an argument that shows that, that this is the number of iterations and the same argument works here. Um, uh, now, of course, the problem is that uh, the condition number can be very large, leading to slow convergence. Um, uh, and by it can be, well, the, of course, the, um, the how large it really is depends on the choice of the kernel and other uh, complications. Mm. But for the Gaussian kernel, I mean, there is a, uh, an interplay between the dimension, but when the dimension is low, the eigenvalues decay exponentially as you go down the spectrum. So as n uh, increases, if, and you order the eigenvalues in decreasing order. So that's actually not good because it means your condition number seems to be going exponentially um, uh, as a function of n. Now, the situation in higher dimension is a little bit better because the, the, in high dimension, the, the decay slows down. Uh, but the whole analysis is gonna be independent of how the spectrum decays actually, because I'm gonna propose a sort of a general way of trying to improve this condition number. But when you have to choose the parameters, of course, you may need to think of what is the actual decay um, in your uh, operator, namely in your kernel. And I just want to make a remark in case you were thinking, why did I choose the model to be in the way it is? And uh, what happens if, for example, you add a standard regularization term? So rather than having this compound optimization problem in model P, what if I do plus some constant times the Hilbert space norm squared as regularization? Um, uh, well, then uh, it's not hard to see that this only helps from the driven of conditioning because the new operator becomes the original one plus a multiple of the identity. So the condition number is only better. So I'm sort of analyzing the hardest case by not doing that. Questions? Okay, so let's uh, go into the first idea to accelerate uh, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent here uh, by improving the spectrum is to do spectral preconditioning. Um, uh, so let me explain what that's going to do in this case. So let's now give names to the eigenvalues of our Hessian operator. Let's call them lambda one to lambda n. 
it's a rank n operator, so this is all that there is, all the non-zero eigenvalues, and they are ordered in non-increasing order. And the current condition number is lambda 1 over lambda n or lambda max over lambda n. What we would like to do is to reduce the condition number by making the maximum eigenvalue smaller without changing the smallest. So here, pictorially, I'm thinking here of a plot of the decay of the eigenvalues. I have lambda 1, lambda n, and then some intermediate eigenvalue lambda q. So what we want is to pre-multiply by another operator that will make the first q eigenvalues equal to lambda q. So this picture and then the rest stay the same. Um, uh, so if you think about that first pictorially, well, what I want is to multiply by the reciprocals of those eigenvalues. So I get some operator P that's supposed to have a spectrum so that in the bottom part after Q, um, I have one corresponding to the, uh, I guess this is uh, corresponding eigenfunctions, if you like, vertically. So after lambda Q, I have a one, and before lambda Q, I have the reciprocal of the eigenvalues times lambda Q. And that's exactly how I define the preconditioner operator PQ. So I fix a level Q, the number of eigenvalues I want to flatten. I use the same eigenfunctions as in the original decomposition of K, but with different eigenvalues. I use lambda Q over lambda I for the first Q and one for the rest onwards. So if you think about it, multiplying K, pre-multiplying K by P is going to achieve what we want. So let's try to think for a moment of, um, so that well, we can do comparisons or, or cost estimates later of what could be the cost and the speed up of doing this. So for the to simplify the analysis, let's assume that Q, the number of eigenvalues that I'm flattening is constant. And then here I have the times for standard gradient descent or number, well, uh, this is, yeah, this is multiplied also by per iteration time, if you like. So this is actual time, not just number of iterations. And then the time for precondition gradient descent. So for standard gradient descent, we have the number of iterations, which was the condition number times log one over tau times the per iteration time, which is essentially n squared. Um, and for the precondition version, well, I have a better condition number of PQK. The usual per iteration time before, this is the time to apply K, which is roughly speaking the gradient to a vector uh, uh, to compute the gradient. But then I also have to apply the preconditioner, which is uh, uh, a rank Q perturbation of the identity. So that will take about time to QN to apply. Um, so my condition number got better. The time per iteration is a little bit worse. But overall, to think about the speed up, I take the ratio of these two times. And after some simple calculation, if essentially lambda 1 over lambda q. Um, and uh, one technicality here, in order to understand uh, better what's going on here, is that both lambda 1 and lambda q will are, by definition, eigenvalues of the Hessian operator k. So they depend on n, the number of data points. And this would make any analysis uh, very complicated. Um, so it's better to, up to a small law, uh, loss or correction, to replace them by the eigenvalues of what we could call the infinite sample operator. So this was K, which comes from an N sample approximation. There is an infinite sample operation when you use the underlying distribution of the data and a corresponding operator. That one is not finite rank anymore, but it has the corresponding eigenvalues and they are closed by some theory. Um, uh, the theory is just a uh, um, uh, convergence of sums of IID random variables, essentially. It's nothing fancy. Um, uh, and now this is independent of n. It only depends on q and the and the kernel k. So this is easier to understand and bound and, and, and work with. 
Um, okay, so this idea of using this kind of precondition is implemented in the algorithm Eigen Pro One of Man Belkin. And this paper has uh, very interesting practical results and some theoretical results. As I said, uh, what the main goal of this talk uh, will be to get some better theoretical results to understand uh, how this works. And, and in particular, how to choose the parameters or how, what will be the cost or the gains of doing this. So let's go on to the second main algorithmic idea here, um, which is that in order to compute the previous preconditioner PQ, I need to know the top Q eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the Hessian operator K. And uh, this, well, this uh, you pay this price potentially more than once because you pay when you construct it. And, but then the size of this uh, preconditioning operator, you pay a price at every iteration. Um, so we're trying to speed up in particular the construction. Mm. So the idea here will be that rather than uh, constructing the preconditioner from the Hessian operator K, a rank N operator, I'm going to subsample the data. So take a subset of size S less than N, and then construct the corresponding uh, empirical approximation to the operator, which is again, the sum of the rank one operators, but only S of them or the average of S of them. And then I want to construct the preconditioner that would come out of this sample from the, from the spectrum of this operator K prime, the subsample operator, and then use that still on the original operator and the iterations of the original operator. So I'm just constructing an approximate preconditioner, if you like, for operator K by using a subsample operator. So this, uh, some version of this is sometimes called a nice from approximation. Uh, it depends on how you proceed, I guess. Um, but you can just think of it as subsampling. And so I proceed similarly or as much as I can, right? So K prime is my subsample uh, operator. And then I consider an eigen decomposition of uh, that operator. And then I construct the corresponding preconditioner using the same technique as before. So I want to flatten the first Q eigenvalues of K prime and I do that by then replacing the eigenvalues by lambda Q prime or by lambda I prime and leaving all the others as one. That will give me again a rank Q perturbation of the identity as a preconditioning operator. And uh, again, we want to proceed as much as possible like before, but there is a technical complication here um, that makes the analysis more difficult which is that the operator that results from applying this approximate preconditioner to K, so PSQK, is not self-adjoint. And therefore the standard theory of bending descent cannot be applied directly. Namely, the, the number of iterations is not so obviously controlled by the condition number of this operator. The condition number now of a non-self-adjoint operator would have to use singular values and, and so on. Um, uh, but there is a simple way out of this, which is to apply a change of basis. So the change of basis that makes this work happens to be the preconditioning operator to the power minus one half. So if FT was the name of the iterates of gradient descent, then in the new basis, we call them GT. And um, is just the, the, the change of basis applied to F. And what do we gain by doing that? We have to write the, the, the iteration of gradient descent in a convenient way. So if the objective was uh, some function L, well, then here is the standard expression for gradient descent. Um, and now when you work this out in, for our particular optimization problem and uh, here, using uh, features of our case, it can be written in this form that makes the analysis uh, very easy. Um, um, so the main thing is that you are uh, repeatedly applying this uh, operator identity minus some 
constant uh, or step size eta times the precondition operator. And after you apply the change of basis, where well, you change the operator to one that is self-adjoint. So that's what uh, recovers the, the nice way of analyzing gradient descent. So now it's this operator identity minus this uh, more complicated PK, uh, PKP. Um, which is actually the uh, another standard way of doing preconditioning, uh, where you apply preconditioning on both sides. But uh, that's not really uh, necessary to understand what's happening here. It's simply I rewrite your in descent in a way that the uh, the operator that appears is self-adjoint, and therefore this, the running time is still controlled by uh, the condition number. So now we are interested in the condition number of p s q one half k p s q one half. Questions? Okay, let's continue. So also to make a parallel with uh, the slide on what are the gains and the speed up, here I have the corresponding analysis for the um, Nystrom approximated preconditioner. We assume again that Q, the number of eigenvalues and flattening is uh, constant. And just to make the formula simpler, I call the new relevant condition number KSQ or kappa SQ. Um, so here I have the original time and now the uh, the, uh, time, the time with the approximate preconditioning um, is just, well, the number of iterations controlled by the condition number and then the per iteration time which is the time to apply the operators that we have with the corresponding sizes. Um, and the speed up, well, um, uh, in the expansion of this uh, time, I'm gonna stop at this final formula here, which is um, the condition number of K divided by the condition number of the precondition operator. And then plus some term here that um, depending on the choice of the parameters would typically be negligible. So the, this uh, is in principle, again, lambda one over, uh, wait, actually, let me think about what I'm going to say here for a minute. Um, actually, no, let me stop here and, uh, and just uh, come back to this uh, behavior of the condition numbers in a later slide. Um, so this uh, idea is implemented in the algorithm EigenPro2 of uh, Sijon Man Belkin. And again, this also has a very interesting practical results and some theoretical results. Um, so what we, we would like to have now is some kind of theoretical guarantee about the speed up and uh, some help in determining how big the subsample needs to be for this to work. So that's why in the estimate of the uh, speed up before I stop there, because in order to proceed in comparing these terms, I need to know how the condition number of the precondition operator compares with S and we don't know much about that yet, but it's gonna become clearer in a moment. And um, uh, the idea will be sort of to establish that we are at a fairly small sample size, in fact, logarithmic, in the number of original data points n, the approximate preconditioning uh, condition number is going to be within a constant factor that we can control of the exact preconditioner condition number. So let me um, say in words what the theorem is saying because this is the main result of the new work. So suppose that the kernel K is symmetric, positive, definite, continuous, unbounded. And then the with probability one minus delta over the choice of your data points, the approximate preconditioner will give you a condition number that is no worse than one plus epsilon to the fourth times the exact preconditioner. And uh, this happens whenever the subsampling parameter S is larger than, and um, uh, so let's see. Um, well, there are a few things here. Um, the some uh, uh, properties of the kernel, so this is just the maximum over the diagonal of the kernel 
divided by the lambda q. And then log n divided by epsilon, all of this to the power four, and then log of one over the probability of success, uh, of failure. Uh, yes. Um, so, of course, um, uh, it takes a little bit of time to digest this, but uh, it's helpful to put uh, sort of reasonable conditions of these parameters so that this uh, becomes more in, uh, easier to interpret. So let's say again that the preconditioning level, so the number of eigenvalues uh, that I'm flattening is constant. And I also make epsilon a constant. So that's why I said it's going to be within a constant factor of the condition numbers in some sense. Um, so then uh, a lot of these terms uh, simplify. And all that remains essentially is the log n to the fourth. And I choose some suitable delta for the probability of failure. And then this, again, as I said in words, is ultimately saying that if your subsampling is log n to the fourth, then uh, your approximation is not going to cost you much. It's only a constant factor in terms of the number of iterations or the condition numbers. Uh, Luis, there's a question in the chat real quick just about uh, the distribution over which you're sampling. Is this sort of uniform distribution over the data that you create S or something else? Um, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, let me think for a moment um, because um, I need to remember. Well, the short answer is, um, uh, wait, let me see what is the simplest answer here. The reason I have to think for a moment is because in the result in the paper, we allow for several choices. So it's quite flexible, but I'm trying to remember what would be the canonical one. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, the flexibility is that any fixed subset, like the first S works, it doesn't have to be random because this, the thing is already intrinsically random. So any fixed subset works, I think, or a uniform subset of size S. Um, uh, the, yes, uh, the, the reason is, uh, you, so you want your subsample to look like uh, a sample of size S of the original distribution, that's all. As long as your choice satisfies that, you're fine. And as you see, the first S satisfy that, and also a, a random subset of size S also satisfies that. And this is uh, discussed in more detail in the paper in any case, but it's flexible. Uh, you can use a separate sample if you want, whatever, yes. Um, and I'll explain in a, in a moment actually where the, uh, well, well, how this happens. As I said, it's just a concentration inequality for operators, it's nothing more. Um, Okay, um, yes. There's, there's one other question in the chat that has to do, it says, uh, what if the eigenvalues of your P, I'm guessing SQ matrix are not computed to high accuracy? I'm guessing if, you know. Um, uh, 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 let's see, uh, do you mean the eigenvalues of K, the operator that you use to construct P? Yeah. Um, um, uh, so let me think for a moment. Well, so here is the great thing about uh, preconditioning, or I, I, the way I understand it is in this context, is that um, if your if your preconditioner is not super accurate, the only price you pay is that well. Um, you may be back at where you started, like your preconditioner doesn't help. Or if your preconditioner is terrible, you could make the spectrum worse. Um, uh, but this just, in the worst case, just means you iterate more with gradient descent. This is kind of not directly related to the accuracy of the iterations themselves. It means you will have to iterate more because ultimately you're just running gradient descent on a worst operator. So I would say uh, not being super accurate is not catastrophic. In fact, a weak approximation could be very good still. Um, uh, well, uh, the, the only thing one needs to be a bit, a bit careful is uh, whether uh, what's going on with the uh, potentially the tiny eigen, the smallest eigenvalues of, of K. 
Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, um, yeah, it seems like I have about nine minutes. Uh, we're almost finished anyways. I'm just gonna give an idea of how to prove this result. So how to analyze this condition number. Um, the, maybe the main difficulty in uh, proving uh, something like, uh, like that inequality between the condition numbers uh, and this kind of, yeah. Uh, is that in order to preserve the small eigenvalues, because I don't want to change them at all, the tail of the spectrum, and those could be tiny, um, I need the, the exact pre the approximate preconditioner to be close to the uh, exact preconditioner in some sort of multiplicative sense. And um, uh, many per standard perturbation bounds are additive, which would be insufficient here. So we need to be extra careful about trying to achieve this multiplicative approximation. So. Uh, the formal uh, approximation that we uh, prove is that when you apply either uh, these two, either of these preconditioners to a particular function, um, the corresponding norms are similar. So we want this ratio to be close to one. This is the relative or multiplicative sense of the approximation that we need. And uh, well, how do we prove this ultimately? Well, the first step is to show that the subsample operator is close to the original operator. So rank S1 is close to the rank N1. Um, in some sense that I'll make more precise in a moment. So I'll, I'll explain each of these steps in more detail. Um, uh, the second step would be that then if the operators are close, then the preconditioners now when applied to a function are closed in this multiplicative sense that I want. And finally, if the preconditioners are closed in this multi multiplicative sense, then I get the inequality for the condition numbers. So let's go to each of these steps in slightly more detail. So the first observation is that, yes, the subsample operator is close to the rank N1, in the Hilbert Schmidt norm by uh, concentration inequality, and this comes from a paper of Rosasco, Belkin, and De Vito. Um, uh, actually, what that paper shows is that either of them is close to the infinite sample operator, but then by triangle inequality, both of them are close to each other. Um, uh, for the purpose of what we need to prove, though, um, uh, it's helpful to have the, this uh, closeness ex uh, expressed in the following way. It's uh, weaker actually because it's in the operator norm is that the square root of K um, is close to the square root of K prime in operator norm in the following sense. The square of the norm is at most uh, some parameter of uh, the kernel, the maximum or the diagonal, and then there is a decay of one over root S. And of course, some dependence on the probability uh, 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 over the choice of the randomness of the data. Okay, now on to the uh, uh, showing that a multiplicative approximation is actually possible. So that's the statement of this lemma here. Um, that uh, well, this just makes it more precise. No, not not it's. The ratio of the operators, the square root of the preconditioning operators, when you apply them to a function, the norms will be close to one between uh, one plus epsilon and one over one plus epsilon, where epsilon um, uh, is some function that grows as log n times the uh, term in the previous slide, namely the difference in the exact operator, uh, sorry, the uh, rank n operator and the rank s approximation of the operators and uh, some other parameters. But the main the main terms here are the log n and the and the norm of the, uh, the, the, the error is between the operators. Um, uh, so now to argue about this, the first observation is that the this uh, multiplicative approximation uh, has also some uh, nice invariance properties. In this case, it's invariance undertaking the inverse of the operators. So I can do PQ to the minus one half, and then the condition is actually equivalent. And it's more convenient to work with them because of spectral properties that we'll see. Um, 
Then let's first get a good additive approximation to these inverse operators. And that just follows, as I announced before, from standard perturbation theory. Well, actually not super standard here. Uh, we had to find some uh, nice inequality of Batia. Um, so uh, what we just want to show is that if the operators, uh, uh, the the Hessian operators are close, the full and subsampled, then um, the corresponding preconditioners are close in operator norm. And the interesting step that we needed here is, well, some sort of understanding of stability of truncating the eigenvalues of an operator. So here I'm thinking of two indefinite operators, A and B. And then I, uh, actually, you can think of them as matrices for this, for uh, this point. Um, and then I make all the negative eigenvalues zero. So I take the positive part. And then the question is, how stable is this operation? And uh, the result is that um, you have a loss that depends on the dimension of order log n. So if the operators are close, then um, uh, the positive parts will be close, but up to a log n loss in operator norm. And then um, to make it multiplicative, we just use the fact that we we have an additive approximation on operators whose, well, before I take the inverse, whose maximum eigenvalue was one, the preconditioners were constructed to be like that. So the inverses will have minimum eigenvalue one. And, and that's the that's all there is to it, right? So in, in, if two numbers are closed in an additive sense and they are both greater than one, then they are also close in a multiplicative sense. So that's what's happening here. Um, okay, so in the last two minutes, let me go to the last step. The last step is suppose you have uh, this uh, multiplicative approximation guarantee on the two preconditioners to each other. How do you get that the condition numbers are close? Well, this is a sequence of steps like the following. Um, if I ha apply the preconditioned version of K with the approximate preconditioner to some function F, then, uh, and I substitute the approximate preconditioner with the exact preconditioner, then I only lose a one plus epsilon factor just by the property I chose the preconditioners to have, the multiplicative approximation. And uh, of course you have to do this multiple times because there is uh, lambda one and the smallest uh, lambda, uh, eigenvalue and so on. But it's a series of steps like this that gives you now their approximation in the condition number. So that completes the high level idea of the proof. And um, I believe that also completes the talk. So I'll leave some time for questions now.